Hello and welcome to the EMC Live Roundtable, Present and Future EMC Challenges for Wireless Design. My name is Belinda Stasiukevich and I'm the Editor of Interference Technology, the creator of EMC Live. EMC Live is a new online event hosted by Interference Technology. Featuring practical information and topics, this event will include roundtables, webinars, and videos on everything EMC related, and there's no cost to attend. Join us for our other webinars today. This roundtable is moderated by Antonio Ferroni. Antonio is the Chief Electromagnetic Energy Scientist at Motorola Solutions. Panelists on this roundtable include Benoit Durat, President of ArtFi, Dave Case, Senior Technical Leader Regulatory at Cisco, Tim Johnson, Senior Certification Engineer for American Certification Body, and Rich Coy, Product Manager of Wireless Certification at UL Verification Services. This roundtable will be interactive. You'll be able to ask questions, and we encourage you to participate. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane, the box on the right-hand corner of your screen. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to fill up the type box and hit Send. To make the screen minimize and maximize, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or report an issue, click the hand icon. We'll discuss the topic today for 45 minutes. Now Antonio will begin the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Belinda. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you'll find this discussion useful. Uh, myself, I also, uh, I'm sure I'm going to learn a few things from our expert panelists. Um, as uh, wireless devices and technologies have evolved, uh, more and more challenges in the domain of uh, EMI and also RF exposure compliance have arise. And this is an opportunity to discuss some of those. Uh, so I will start with um, maybe you know, a very generic question, and that is, uh, what are the current most challenging EMI, so related to electromagnetic interference and compatibility issues that affect uh, modern consumer devices? When we look at smartphones, tablets, uh, laptops, and even uh, wearable devices. Uh, is there anyone, anyone from our panel that wants to start? Yeah, Tony, this is Dave. Um, I think what we talk, one of the things is, is key in this one is probably not just the, the regular compliance, but the interaction of multiple radios and multiple antennas and devices, such as smartphones, which are extremely small, or tablets, or even in computers where we have coexistence issues. Where we're actually before we used to have 2.4 or 5 gigahertz radio, now we get 245, a uh, bunch of cell, a lot of cellular PCFs, um, Zigbee and stuff. I guess what the challenges are to get those to be interact before you can go into the compliance phase of testing. Thank you. Um, anyone else wants to chime in? Yeah, um, this is uh, Rishlu. Um, so just just to add to the, the current issue that's been faced um, with EM, EMI um, um, uh, in newer technologies as well. Um, I mean, coexistence, yes, is one of um, the biggest issue when we come to multiple bandwidths in um, devices and also uh, multiple carriers and so on, um, especially when device support co-location as well as being in an environment that is very um, noisy. So um, I, the, the current standard um, that addresses these, um, that these normal EMC or EMI issues are adequate enough to go, get you through the approval process, but in the normal working environment, you do see that um, these issues are quite um, uh, um, um, alarming for, for um, uh, the, the actual end users. And so um, coexistence is starting to be more and more of a proprietary, but yet a popular service, service that manufacturers would like to perform, especially within the ISM band of the 2.45 gigahertz, and also introduce um, our cellular technology as well to see how the performance of the device would be. Thank you. Do you expect, uh, just to follow up on this, uh, these, uh, these issues to become even more uh, important uh, as we move forward to the next generation of wireless technologies, the so-called 5G? Yeah. Um, so, sorry, this is uh, Rishli. Uh, yes, we, we, we do anticipate 
yeah, we're um, seeing more and more of these issues um, um, occurring as we progress to 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 5G technology, um, simply because um, the there are more and there are, there are more bands that are being introduced um, in, in terms of the technology, and everything is going to the internet of things. So you have uh, multiple devices now that are all interconnected wires, wirelessly. So we will have those issues, um, except we can actually find a way of um, comprehensively um, um, addressing it um, within standards and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so given the, this landscape um, where we are aware of uh, current challenges and we expect even more, um, are you, um, and I'm asking uh, each one of the panelists, aware of measurement techniques or um, instrumentation protocols that have become available or have been developed uh, to more effectively address uh, uh, magnetic interference? Mm -hmm. In, uh, in this kind of devices? Uh, so this is Dave. Uh, yes, we've, you've got to look at recently you have C6310-2013, C6340-2014 uh, has been out there, you've got, uh, which is basically DOT26, which is the licensed version of the DOT10 standard for testing, which is in the works now and hopefully being voted on. Uh, these are new uh, updated test standards with changes to the test sites and test methodology. They, to address new issues such as newer technology, 700 megahertz, uh, you know, up to five gigahertz band, so that some of the millimeter wave devices um, part there. Then you also have got with the end of site for like the, the hearing aid compatibility testing. Uh, they recently got the um, you've got the the, the, the the technology to do the the, the, the simulate the the Volta the Volta testing for hack and stuff, which is important because we haven't had that for a while now. We can actually test. Uh, the, the voice over LTE handsets for hacks. So I think we have seen changes, and we will see more coming. Yeah, Antonio, this is uh, this is Benoit. I think in terms of techniques that have been that I've been aware of um, released in the, in the recent years, I, I mean, it is especially important from the EMI EMC perspective to identify at the PCB level for PCB designers, um, like uh, high speed or high power, high density kind of PCBs to identify where are the sources of, let's say, potential unintended radiators or RF leakages. And um, there were some tools that used to be, I mean, um, utilized in the uh, R&D process for such PCBs, like a robot, um, a small robot moving a detected probe above um, a PCB just to scan the field, either electric or magnetic, and try to get the PCB uh, designer identify where are the the, the, the problems, the spurious emission sources, and uh, recently um, there were some innovations in that, like uh, some companies started to um, design um, RF scanners, like planar scanners that contain multiple probes and can scan in a very rapid manner, um, let's say that the field in the very vicinity of the PCB to help for the designers identify very quickly the sources of issues uh, of EMI and EMC uh, at the PCB level. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to provide some inputs? Um, yeah, this is uh, Rich. Uh, just to add as well, um, in, in terms of um, techniques as well, I mean, more and more manufacturers are going into uh, debugging process, and we are seeing from, from a laboratory point of view, we are seeing um, um, rapid um, improvement in terms of instruments that we use for testing. Um, for example, if you were testing um, LTE technology, the introduction of notch filter um, to actually help you with the carrier, suppressing the carriers and et cetera. Um, we've seen um, the introduction of um, CMW500 to handle LTE and um, LTE advanced that is coming up as well. And um, also within the, the, the o o OTA uh, remit as well, over the air testing, um, we are aware that there is carrier aggregation that is um, um, being introduced. And uh, obviously, there, there are also test sets and, 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 and um, instrumentations that are now available that can assist um, to, to actually address those. Thank you, Rich. Um, so these uh, 
inputs you provided, they seem to be mostly uh, oriented towards uh, solving problems once there is uh, evidence of a problem. So debugging, for example, performing near field mapping of the currents or the charges on a piece of board. Now, uh, probably I can provide some inputs on the um, other side of the problem, the, the, the design of uh, robust uh, EMI uh, from an EMI, EMI perspective product. And that is the, the, the use of electromagnetic, electromagnetic simulations. Uh, today uh, we have tools, uh, for example, uh, uh, CST, Microwave Studio, Empire, and others, uh, uh, XFTTB and other uh, kind of tools that uh, allow to perform very accurate simulation of complex uh, structures such as multi-layer PC board. And they frequently allow to uh, prevent the onset of issues at the product stage. So I've seen that uh, the use of these uh, um, simulations have, has uh, really increased uh, dramatically over the last few years, also thanks to the availability of uh, very powerful hardware that can uh, allow to run very large uh, domain problems. And that has been the key for the uh, development, I mean, the, the, the um, expansion of the use of simulations uh, also in the EMI area. Uh, now also, to go further on this uh, topic, and introducing actually the, the RF exposure issue. In terms of uh, uh, instrumentation, uh, there is also a challenge to address uh, future technologies such as 5G from an RF exposure evaluation point of view. Because today's uh, systems uh, that rely mainly on uh, scans performed by electric field probes, they seem not to be adequate to uh, produce reliable uh, evaluation of the exposure above 6 gigahertz. Uh, they have been really designed to operate below 6 gigahertz. So uh, there is an ongoing uh, activity within the industry trying to involve researchers to develop uh, new systems that will allow to uh, evaluate exposure efficiently for uh, portable wireless devices that may operate at frequencies well above 10 gigahertz. So uh, then introduce, uh, introduces the, the essentially the next topic besides EMI, which is the compliance with the radio frequency exposure limits, typically as they are when we are talking about uh, portable devices. So my question to the panel is that uh, is what are the most common difficult challenges related to radio frequency exposure? and in particular SAR compliance for modern consumer devices. Well, this is Dumas speaking. Uh, I'd like to start this, this question. Um, I think it's a very interesting question and, and the way you introduce it, Antonio, is, is very broad and uh, maybe not starting with the millimeter wave, which is uh, it's a very uh, complex and, and definitely an ongoing research topic. Just talking about I mean, the, the challenge is that consumer devices, modern consumer devices um, can, uh, I mean, raise in terms of uh, RF exposure. Well, first of all, from the design side, definitely, I mean, in these past years, um, all the mobile wireless devices that have become available uh, were really, um, I mean, such guided by kind of a really strong design features and they have to be, they have to look good, they have to be very convenient, user friendly. Uh, some of them include metal frames and things like that to look fancy. And in terms of design, that that makes things very complex for the antenna designers, especially because now they have very small volumes where to put the antennas and they have to, to cover many bands. And on top of that, they have to pass uh, regulatory limits for, for uh, uh, I mean, relating to exposure and, and SAR testing. And to, to them, it means typically very thin device that has to be measured in many different sorts of, of positions, conditions, 
and in very close vicinity to the to the mannequin, to the the phantoms mimicking the human body, and it's very difficult to at the same time get a good antenna design that allows to radiate very efficiently in order to maintain a good communication quality, and on the other hand, pass all the SAR tests successfully below the limit while you have to measure the device in so many different conditions. The power has really to go out by somewhere if you want it to radiate, if you want the device to radiate towards the base station. Uh, maybe I'd like to let the, another panelist respond a little more on this question, but I'd like to get back to the millimeter wave question afterwards. Okay, thank you, Benoit. Um, anyone else? Yeah, this is Dave. Uh, one of the things we're looking at, too, is um, for the testing is obviously we're talking about the, the devices. And he did, Benoit mentioned millimeter, right? Um, is the use of smart antennas, of, you know, of beam forming. Um, and you've got these devices with seven, eight, nine antennas in them. In some cases, you may have some beam forming there. And the issue is going to be going forward for testing. How do we make sure that you're testing and have all the all the, the most number of elements up, you know, for say a five five point four gigahertz signal um, turned out so you have you're getting you're getting you know you're getting the true pattern of the device because as the device moves and how it's looking at the, the beam forming will change. Um, I think those issues will have to be addressed eventually because a lot of this stuff is still based on you know we've designed with you know we have single antenna, but now with the multiple antennas that you can use it multiple antennas across multiple bands. And with the, it's going to be a, more of a challenge to do that, which is going to be taking work into the standards committees to change that. And, and millimeter devices is going to be another one because to really get the effect of your happy use of being forming a specialized antennas. Uh, and I think that's going to um, really change the thing, how we're going to do that, how we're going to address these issues above 6 gigahertz into the, the 5G, so to speak. And we're still trying to address the issues below 6 you know, six gigahertz. How do we get? How do we do the beam forming and stuff like that? We're addressing those issues. I think there's a lot of work ahead for us. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Uh, um, Benoit, you're you're about to say something. Yeah, I think also in in the millimeter wave part. I mean, the, one of the big. Uh, I mean, definitely the assessment of exposure at those frequencies is very challenging because here we are speaking of of devices that may um, really. Uh, I mean, uh, where, where the the, the, the the field that's radiated attenuate pretty fast with distance, and the only really relevant exposure cases are when you have, when you can imagine having a 60 gigahertz transmitter, for example, in a, in a smartphone or a tablet, and this, this device is held in the hand, and it's in, like the antenna is in direct contact with the skin. And the thing is, you would like to assess the exposure like in this contact situation, but to do that is it's pretty tricky. Like. I mean, if you would use a classical method, you would like to bring your probe very, very close to the device, but in which case you would perturbate the device under test. So I think, I mean, those kind of, of, um, of um, let's say, there is a research needed in that field to, I mean, basically try to understand how we can measure um, somehow the device at a further distance and, and get back to the field in a very, in a very close uh, vicinity of the device to assess the exposure either by maybe near-field transform methods, but getting back to your initial point, Antonio, I think also the simulation certainly uh, brings some promises in, in this field. I, I think the final solution will probably be a mix between measurement and simulation somewhere. Well, yes, yeah, so you make a very interesting point, um, Benoit. And in terms of simulation, uh, one can also envision the simulation not only of SAR, uh, because the SAR is really a surrogate for temperature rise in terms of RF uh, safety, uh, but directly the simulation of temperature rise. So that's uh, a possibility. The moment you open, you know, compliance methodologies to the use of simulations, simulating a thermal process is no more difficult than simulating an electromagnetic process. Actually, it's easier from 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 a certain point of view. So. Um, so it, it is entirely possible that uh, eventually exposure can, could be addressed at the higher frequencies through temperature simulations, a mix of both temperature and electromagnetic simulations, depending on uh, what the standards establish for the basic restrictions, and even possibly thermal measurements, because when the exposure is very uh, confined in the surf on the surface of the body, essentially on the skin, 
I mean, it's not far-fetched to envision even an infrared method that could provide a reliable exposure assessment. Uh, obviously, this would require research, would require qualification of any instrumentation that would be produced for that purpose. Uh, but right now, <clears throat> one thing is clear, at least to me, that uh, the current method of using electric field probes is not necessarily suitable for addressing exposure at the higher frequencies. So that's an open. Uh, it's going to. It's an open uh, issue, and uh, uh, the standard committees and research uh, institutions first will have to deal with that. Now, going back uh, just for a second to beam forming and building on what uh, Dave mentioned, essentially the complexity of uh, of uh, uh, evaluating the peak exposure from an antenna system uh, placed in the near field. Uh, near the body, so the body is in the near field of this antenna system. So evaluating the peak exposure from all possible combination of excitations uh, from multiple antennas, or multiple antennas with the same signal, so correlated signal, that presents an interesting challenge, because nowadays SAR measurement systems are based on uh, diode probes that rectify the signal so the phase information is lost. And uh, there is a, a technical report uh, developed by the IEC. It's called IEC 62630 that has outlined a few techniques that could be used to uh, perform an overestimation of the exposure from multiple antennas um, used for informing, so emitting correlated signals. Uh, so there is a penalty to be paid if the current uh, uh, instrumentation is, uh, is kept because the exposure in order to be conserved it can only be uh, overestimated due to the lack of phase information. <coughs> so you know, I'm very familiar with, the, with your new system uh, for measuring SAR which also allows the measurement of the phase. Or signal. So I was wondering if uh, you have any inputs re re regarding essentially the ability of these uh, vector probe array systems to evaluate accurately uh, devices that employ beamforming. Yes, thank you, Antonio. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting point you're making here. That um, I mean, truly, I mean the traditional state-of-the-art systems they are I mean bound to basically overestimate the exposure in, in cases of correlated signal. And, and you're right, our, our system has this capacity to measure amplitude phase, and so will the systems that will comply with the standard on, under development 62209-3. Well, definitely there are more efficient methods, like the one that you mentioned that is, um, that is in the technical report you talked about, uh, that can be applied with those systems. Uh, what can you do? I mean, to uh, assess very efficiently the SAR for any case of, of MIMO, let's say, scheme or things like that. If you have, let's, for, let's imagine, for example, a wireless device with two antennas, well, as the field, they would basically combine uh, linearly into the mannequin. Like, if you have one antenna radiating and the other e is off, then you would have the field E1, I mean, amplitude and phase field E1 into the mannequin, and then you you could measure also the other antenna, the antenna number two, while the antenna one is off, and you get a field E2, and basically every kind of excitation you can put on your antenna, different kinds of amplitude and phase, from those two measurements of E1 and E2 could be calculated just by post-processing, as it's only a linear, linear combination. So yes, these amplitude and phase systems uh, they allow to evaluate exposure for all kind of, of MIMO combinations that you can think of, but in like if you have N antennas in the system, and you can do it in N measurements, and then as many processing cases as you want. Thank you, Benoit. Uh, I have a kind of a related question that does not have to, uh, to do with beamforming, but essentially with the waveform. So if we look at the, for example, LTE, LT allows so many operating modes, and the waveform can, you know, can change so so widely. Um, so I was wondering, what kind of uh, um, challenges does it pose from uh, a measurement perspective, uh, particularly a measurement, 
And whether there are uh, new instrumentation uh, or measurement techniques that may allow to overcome some of those difficulties. Uh, um, Rich, do you want to take this question or? Um, yeah, I mean, with I, I, I can actually talk about the, the, the current system and how far it goes into um, addressing um, the, the, the current technology. Um, I mean, we, we, uh, we, when, when we talk about um, LTE and um, even uh, the 5G technology that is using a, a broader bandwidth, um, the, the system, the, the current system can handle to a certain extent um, um, uh, most, of, most of these technology, but what you have is when you start to introduce the very um, ultra-wide band type signals, um, you have limitations and obviously higher peak to average ratio um, uh, for, for signal as well. The system will have to be calibrated specifically um, in that manner as opposed to calibrating on a CW um, signal. So when we when we look at um, our current measurement technique, yes, it's overestimating to um, um, the, the the SAR value, but um, things that we see as as uh, maybe shortcomings, which can hopefully be addressed uh, fairly soon, is um, with the broadband signal where you have 20 megahertz or you might have um, 100 over 100 megahertz bandwidth, you have your your fluid currently being um, um, validated with uh, plus or minus five percent from the spot frequency and the system um, is actually looking at a spot frequency. So I, I guess um, maybe more research or so needs to be done to look into how um, the, the, the broader bandwidth will actually affect the SAR value um, with um, 4 and 5G technology as well and is our current measurement really overestimating what we think it, um, what, what, uh, in, in terms of what we think in, uh, theoretically. Yeah, I, I think uh, I totally agree with, with Rich's points, and, and I think another point is relating to the test efficiency. I mean, uh, well, when you when you think about uh, all what they, I mean, what the, the mobile phone manufacturers and designers have to go to, uh, where they have to go through to do all those tests, like, um, I mean, the, the classical state-of-the-art detected probes that are, um, I mean, slow response probes, and they don't really uh, correctly um, monitor the envelope of the signal, or the spectral content of the signal is not identified. For those probes that need really uh, uh, specific calibration sometimes, or you need to know in advance the duty cycle of the signal to ensure that you that you um, get a proper uh, response uh, or a absolute value as an output. And that would, gen that would, in some cases, like especially the Wi-Fi wi uh, types of transmission modes, where you have maybe uh, random bursts and, and uh, very high peak to average ratios and so on, that you kind of program as a mobile phone manufacturer some specific test modes into your device because the system is not really capable of understanding exactly how the signal behaves, so you more or less have to set the, the, the device under test in a specific condition to ensure that you get an output that really reflects what you want to measure. And definitely there, again, with the 6209-3 kind of systems, we are kind of really tackling this, uh, this thing that we want to be kind of signal independent, like we don't need to put a device in a specific test mode, we want the system to be capable of recognizing the envelope of the, of the signal under, uh, of the device under test knowing the spectral content of, this, of the device, uh, of, the, of the signal of the device under test, so that the measurement system would really get a value of the power that's radiated by the device, not only a value that's estimated with a certain cor correction factor that you, that you enter in your, in your software to correct your probe, I mean, basically poor response. Uh, yes, I'm, um, I just want to clarify something. Thank you very much, Benoit. I mean, uh, clearly, we are aware of limitations of the current uh, um, systems in terms of addressing these uh, spread spectrum waveforms and uh, beamforming. At the same time, at the same time, we don't want to give the impression to the listeners that these systems do not do an adequate job at providing 
a conservative evaluation of the exposure. They do provide, in fact, a conservative evaluation of the, of the exposure. And sometimes, because of their shortcomings due to the specific probe technology that currently employed, the evaluation has to be uh, exaggerated. So typically, for uh, spread spectrum waveforms, the uh, estimated exposure is higher than what would be um, estimated if we had instrumentation that could measure both magnitude and phase of the electric field. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what you said, Anton. Definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on to a more broad topic, which has to be, and uh, it involves both EME, so RF exposure, and uh, EMC, EMI. And that is uh, uh, the importance of uh, harmonized uh, regulations, and typically harmonized regulations in they stem out of uh, harmonized standards. Uh, obviously, regulations are national regulations, uh, so some, some countries uh, tend to depart from others, but uh, I'm also aware of lack of harmonization, harmonization sometimes in standards. So uh, from a manufacturer perspective, from a test lab perspective, uh, how important it is the, to have uh, as much as possible and harmonize the regulatory uh, framework uh, worldwide and what are the opportunities and the means to achieve that. Well, this is Dave. I'd like to start this out and I also think it's good for the, the TCBs also to answer is that um, we've got, you know, looking from our point of view, we want to do the test because the test done correctly. It, the simpler the test is we want to do one setup because obviously going to a lab, it, it, time and money is important, you know, to get the market. Um, so doing three or four tests to verify EMC for different standards is typically a non-starter thing with some of the radio tests. Now, obviously, some of the radio tests, and such as you know different frequency bands and stuff for countries, is going to be different. However, we're looking at stuff like uh, SAR testing or uh, you know hearing aid compatibility testing, which are, which are all pretty much the same. You know, SAR, those are all important, but they can be all done the same because we're all looking for the same answer. Does it meet this limit? So I think there's importance there. Harmonization. I think the issue is, though, is getting some of the. the and we're seeing this at least in the IEC, IE, which you believe say when we're starting to work at a dual logo standards, but we did get some of the other standards committees to work together to harmonize, like CISPR 32 and ANSI 3634, or something like that, where we're, we're the trying to get this thing cleared up so the agency will accept one test across the board uh, is important. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, anyone else want to chime in? Tony, just Tim, Tim Johnson from ACB. Uh, essentially, we uh, as a TCB are commonly still seeing a lot of submittals where they're submitting us one set of data uh, for both, like for FCC and Canada. And commonly, Canada has finite differences, even with the SAR, that has to be addressed. And I know going back to the various labs and uh, manufacturers. Uh, tends to get very aggravating for both sides of the, of, of the fence on this, both from a time perspective, as Dave mentioned, uh, but also from a TCB perspective. And the lab thinks they've addressed everything all along as, as they submit it. So this is a very common problem. So any harmonization efforts that are done, uh, you know, between FCC, IC, Europe, worldwide, are, are definitely going to be a help toward the future. Oh, uh, I, I definitely agree. I mean, as a manufacturer, we we see the lack of harmonization in some cases as really disruptive. Uh, uh, particularly, like the example you're you're we're talking about between Canada and the United States. We uh, in my company we see North America as a single market and having to deal with different standards uh, creates issues, uh, different regulations, let's say. So clearly, uh, from a manufacturer point of view, it is of paramount importance that uh, regulations are harmonized as much as possible. Um, anyone else wants to provide some input on this topic? Yeah, this is Benoit. Well, I think I, I just have, I mean, everything that was said is, is, is really, I mean, to the point. Uh, I just want to add that 
definitely it's uh, harmonization of standards is something ex I mean, really needed. Harmonization in general is something really needed. Harmonization of standards is something more straightforward, I would say, because standards committee are basically made of experts that would uh, agree between them on some trade-off that would mostly involve, a, I would say, technical and scientific discussions and trying to, I mean, especially in the case of fire exposure, get conservative estimate of the exposure. So everything turns around that. As for the regulators and, and getting harmonization in different regulations, it's something very difficult because definitely they also take into account the scientific and technical aspects, but in each different country, they would also have political and social and I don't know what kind of psychological uh, issues to, uh, to take into account. That, that makes, I mean, every country very particular and I would say even though it's very wishable for the whole world that this harmonization uh, exists and it's, it's a goal we need to try to achieve, it's also a kind of a utopia somehow that all the countries will at some point share all the same policies. But, I mean, that's my opinion. Thank you, Benoit. Uh, clearly, um, yes, it, it is going to be very difficult, but still uh, I would consider that uh, uh, an important uh, um, aspect of, for example, the um, standardization activities that we are involved in. Um, okay, so I have now a specific question that has to do uh, with the European regulation. Uh, recently, uh, the European Union uh, decided to update its uh, radio equipment directive, so they issued a new, uh, now it's called the, it used to be called the RNTT, now it's called the RED, RED, Radio Equipment Directive. Uh, I think it will become effective uh, in Europe in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and in any case, I, was, uh, I wanted to know what is your uh, opinion about what the, the probable impact of this new uh, regulation. Yeah, uh, this is Rich. Um, I, I believe um, the new red regulation, which will be um, coming in at some point next year, um, is actually um, going to be quite good in terms of um, uh, Europe, because at least we will then be a bit more stringently regulated um, to address uh, most of the, the current issue. So it will put a lot of structure in place. Uh, in terms of testing standards and methodology that is used and the way in which notify body will be assessing um, devices and reviewing devices as well and their behavior of manufacturers. So uh, I think it's good. Um, obviously there's a lot still that needs to be um, sorted with in the, in the directive, but um, I think it's going in, in, in the right way. Uh, thank you, Rich. Um, Maybe Dave wants to add something on that. Um, yeah, I, there, there, we're seeing, you know, looking at things, some changes. I think there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Uh, some of the information on, you know, for stable use, and discussions going on from the SAR testing, and how some of the things will be done. I think it's going to be kind of like going back to the CE directive when it first came out in '96, and the RTTE trying to. It's going to take a little bit for industry to. Know, full of grasp with you know what what's what's allowed what's not allowed because there are again there's more structure changes there's more structure here as was pointed out I think it's going to take us a little bit to really get around it and get a hand grasp on it um, from that point of view because I think you know we're still looking at it um, you know there's there's a lot of positive changes to it it just it's going to take us a while for the industry to really absorb it and how do we how do we get into the mode of this how we do things here's the changes how do we address those changes how do we going forward. Thank you, Dave. So the the date that we were just mentioning, 2016, is that a deadline for all uh, EU countries to adopt uh, this new directive? Rich? 
Uh, sorry, um, there is a transition phase. So um, yeah, within within um, that duration of time, yeah, you are expected to uh, um, um, start start to adopt the standard. And um, I'm just trying to find out the, the concise date, which I can actually update you on um, when it ceases to exist in terms of the RNTT and continue to be the the, the the red directive. But there is a transition phase, so there won't be a dead stop date. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, finally, I have a last question for everybody, and maybe it's also possibly very interesting for the audience. And that is, uh, I mean, given the fact, you know, all the challenges that we just talked about, uh, both from a technical point of view and a regulatory point of view, and uh, we know that uh, uh, personnel that typically deals with this kind of regulations, indeed, they have technical background. Uh, most of us are engineers. Uh, uh, so, uh, do you uh, think that this area of um, EME and EMC compliance, design for compliance, and also the corresponding uh, uh, areas for radio frequency exposure compliance, are these promising areas for uh, new engineers? Need increase? I will say yes. I think the simple answer would be yes. It is. If we're going forward, yes, it is something which is a career opportunity. So, so do you see, uh, you know, that a need for this kind of uh, profile? Uh, do you see companies hiring this kind of, uh, people with the the expertise to address uh, possibly both these areas from a technical point of view and a regulatory uh, point of view? Well, actually, uh, I can tell you about my, my small case, but my company is really hiring in that field, and we actually have a lot of difficulties to find competent people. Uh, most of the very good experts are somewhere in a good company where they are doing their excellent jobs, so you have to kind of uh, try to get them out of their company and join you. As actually, I think we lack a little bit of uh, engineers in this field, and that's a pity because there are so many, with the wearables and the connected objects, there are so many cases where EMC and SAR are involved these days, and it, it, will, it will not stop here. I mean, it's, it's a big trend. So definitely for me, I think it's a very, very promising field for new engineers to go, and, and there will be a lot of work for them, that's for sure. Yeah, just uh, just just to add as well, uh, because I, I'm coming from from the, from the laboratory side of things. Um, yeah, we we do find it quite difficult to find the experience you need um, specifically for for SAR um, um, evaluation, simply because of the complexity in technology, and the, the engineers now have to understand the technology, not just know how to press the buttons. Um, and this is um, this is a, uh, currently there is a shortage of this. And usually, when you are recruiting, you tend to have um, people who have less experience, and you have to train them up, which takes time as well. So um, yeah, this is a niche market. But yeah, I think um, with changing regulations and um, the advance in innovation, it would definitely attract a lot of people to um, and start to focus on this field, in this field. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all. I think we are getting close to the end of this 45-minute uh, session. Uh, I would really like to thank you for your availability and the information that you have been willing to share. Uh, it's been useful for me. Uh, I hope it's, gonna, it's been also useful for our audience. Um, so I was wondering if Belinda has any final remarks. Great. Thank you, Antonio. We'd like to have a call for final questions from the audience. Please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We will send all questions to speakers after the roundtable. We have received a lot of questions we want to address in the future. Please join us for EMC Live 2015, three-day event, which takes place April 28th to 30th. Roundtable attendees, if you have any more questions, please send us an email. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website, emclive2015.com. We will also send a link to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending.